Yes. But they've only uh, been on that wall. Yeah, that was only three of the names in case you've been in a circle. I didn't know what the L for you yeah, the owner's kind of he's kind of a guy, like he's one of those guys he comes across, it's like you know, we can't talk to him, he's gonna bite your head off kind of guy. And it was yeah, he's he's a dog thing on Hey y'all, good morning, glad you're joining us for our study, How to Read the Bible, we're continuing, so uh, what I'd like you to do is to go over your homework with uh, folks at your table, um, here's your two slides that have to do, well, it's going the wrong way, there we go. I told you that your homework was to read the first three chapters of Matthew, find the four references he makes to the Old Testament, and then go read those in their original context. And then after you read it, I wanted y'all to write down your observations regarding the following. Meaning to the people receiving the message, the Jewish people, the meaning of that passage in relationship to the Christ event, meaning for the church today, and meaning for secular society. So I'm going to let y'all discuss it in your tables uh, briefly, and then I'll come back and we will talk about it together. Go. So the general can see me that they the king. Thank <laughs> you. 
Well, so one of the reasons that I wanted y'all to write down your observations about the meaning of one of these, you know, all four of these prophecies, uh, the meaning to the people originally receiving the message versus the meaning in relationship to the Christ event is because sometimes I think it may surprise people uh the meaning in the original setting may or may not be exactly the same as the meaning when you look at it in the context of the christ event but i don't know what y'all found so who wants to start uh give us your observation uh of one of the references not all of them just just pick one and then uh talk about the meaning to the people receiving the message originally that would be the jewish people Okay, so what's the what's the reference you want to talk about, Carol? So what is the quote from Matthew two? Oh, okay. Okay, so two six, and that was a reference to Micah. You found. Okay. So now let's read the, the the quotation in its original context from Micah chapter five. Maybe back up and read like chapter five, verse one and following until you get to the the verse that uh, Matthew is quoting. Okay, so let's just stop there. So this is one of those places where I'm, that's why I wanted y'all to write it down, what your observations were. Is the meaning to the people who originally heard that message from Micah chapter five, just the first five verses or so, do you think that that meaning was the same to them as it is to its relationship to the Christ event? Well, I mean, they, they would have understood something, but I mean, did they? I think what you're saying, Carol, is they may not have understood it in relationship to the Christ event. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. How do you think they understood it? Okay. Okay. How about the, the people to whom Micah is speaking, the prophet Micah is speaking? 
What do you think? Do you? What do you think they may have understood in their own time when Micah was preaching that to them? How does he start out the chapter again? Somebody else read it nice and loudly. Micah chapter five, beginning at the first verse. Okay, this is why I'm asking you all to do this. See, I want you to see the connection. So what's interesting is that Matthew quotes this verse about the ruler that comes from uh, Bethlehem as uh, referring to Jesus. But of course, Jesus is not going to be a military messiah now, is he? So... Uh, this is why I wanted us to do the exercise. A, I want you to see the connections between Old and New Testament, but B, I, I want it to be clear to us why so many people um, may have not put it together, this, uh, this prophecy in terms of the Christ event. Because when the Christ appeared, he appeared and came in peace rather than in war. Now, did I see a hand? Fire away. Right. Well, let's read that. Let's read that reference. Read just a few verses around it. Give us a little bit of context. Which chapter of Jeremiah was that from? I'm sorry, 31, 15. Then back up to verse 10, let's say, and give us like five verses there, 10 through 15. Read it. Somebody read it nice and loudly so that the whole room can hear very, very easily. The young men and old shall be married. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them, give them gladness for sorrow. I will cease the flow of grief with abundance, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, declares the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Lord, Sister Rama, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Okay. So the context in Jeremiah, uh, if you're uh you may already you may already know this. The context in Jeremiah is Jeremiah is preaching this sermon after Babylon has come in and they have conquered uh Jerusalem and they have already taken the best and brightest, the cream of the crop, away from Jerusalem, and they have taken them back to Babylon, modern day Iraq. Okay, everybody with me? So it's the Babylon, it's the beginning of the Babylonian captivity. Many of you who have studied the Bible at all, you 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 know that part of the history, right? The people will be in bondage in Babylon for 70 years. Okay. So to those people hearing that sermon, what do you think they hear when the prophet is preaching and saying, 
But the same God who scattered his people is going to gather them again. What are they hearing? that eventually they will be brought back together. And then when Rachel is weeping for her children, who's Rachel? She's the wife of? Okay. Uh, and she's weeping for her descendants, right? Because the 12 patriarchs came from Jacob, right? So she's weeping like, from, it's like, it's a, the image is like, of he, like she's in heaven weeping for her children or whatever, right? Do y'all see this? It's like a, an ancestor weeping for your current situation. Why? Because they are they may be being promised that they're going to be gathered together again at some future date. But for now, and when we're talking about 70 years for the rest of your life, where are you going to go live? You're going to go live in Babylon. That's where you're going to go live. And maybe your grandkids will come back here. Right. Like that's the that's the promise. Your grandbabies will be able to come back, but you're going to die in Babylon. Your kids are going to die in Babylon, right? Are you all with me? So there's a meaning to the people who are hearing the sermon in that context. Why, now go back to Matthew. Why does Matthew say that Rachel is weeping for her children? Well, is that the context in Matthew? Yeah. Because Herod killed all the, the kids two years of age and younger. So Matthew is relating that same Rachel weeping for her children to the events that are happening in first century Palestine under the Roman uh, Imperium. That's a different context than the context to which Jeremiah originally preached it. Is it an unfair attribution, though? If Rachel weeps for her children at the Babylonian captivity, is it also fair to say that Rachel probably weeps for her children when Herod kills all the kids two years age and younger? Is that a fair attribution? Well, sure, it's fair. He can reach back for that and apply it to a different context. This is what I'm trying to get y'all to see about prophecy. It has sort of it's it's like a meteor hitting the earth right there's a point of impact bam that's when jeremiah preached it the babylonian captivity bam rachel's weeping for her children but then there's circles that go out from there there's circles of meaning that go out from there is it an unfair attribution for matthew to apply that same verse rachel weeps for her children to the killing of the innocents under herod we all said, no, that's fair. You can do that. What about meaning for the secular society today? Let's skip down to that last bullet point. Meaning for secular society today. Can someone give me something that recently happened in the news in the same region of the world where you might attribute Rachel weeps for her children? Y'all are mumbling. Gaza. The, the terrorist attacks in Gaza, people were just murdered in the street. And it was shocking. So could you apply the same verse to a secular event? Well, sure. Okay. How about meaning for the church today? What is the meaning of Rachel Weeps for her children to the, for the church today? Is there a meaning? There's, there's fewer Christians in America by percentage, but there's more Christians in the world because the more they try to squish us, the more we multiply. <laughs> How about the murder of Christians all throughout the world? So to your point, Carol, about the number of Christians, what is the most persecuted religion in the world by the UN's own research? The United Nations own research. What is the most persecuted religion in the world? Christians. And there was a there was a speech I heard get delivered at the United Nations uh, headquarters in New York where 
it was a Jewish scholar who got up there and said, he made a big point to say, I'm a Jew. So we always talk about anti-Semitism and it is a real problem, he said. But let me tell you who's the most persecuted group on the face of planet Earth. And I'm saying this as a Jew, it's Christians. So it's it's known, it's a known fact, right? So yeah, you could apply it to, to the church today. Rachel weeps for her children, very good, yeah. Okay, it, you, there could be a spiritual application in that sense. Yeah, absolutely. So do y'all see how this is, how I'm trying to get you to think about prophecy? This is a really great example, Rachel weeps for her children. But what I want you to see is that it, it doesn't have meaning for the Christ event or the church today or for secular society until you first determine what the meaning was for the Jewish people at the time that they heard the sermon originally. Does that make sense to everybody outside my own head? It has an original meaning because it was a real sermon preached in a real context. Okay. Um, and that meaning doesn't start with the Christ event, but starts in the context in which the sermon was delivered. Why is that important to make that point? Because why? Yeah, you want to understand the origins so that you understand how it's being applied, right? But also, guys, God didn't leave people alone until Jesus came. He he spoke to his people because he loves them. So if it doesn't have meaning in the original context with the Jewish people back in their day, even if it is the same or different than it's being applied to the Christ event, if it doesn't have meaning to them in their own context, then I'm not sure what we're doing because it means that God doesn't really love them. He's play acting while all this horrific stuff happens in history just so that later it can apply to Jesus. And that isn't the God that we worship and serve. We worship a God and we serve a God who loves his people throughout history. And so he spoke a message to his people, the Jewish people, back in the day. You know, it was back in the day. It was a Taco Tuesday. And then that message can also be applied to the coming of the Messiah. Legitimately can be applied. Yeah. It is all about Jesus, but that doesn't mean that when Jesus is talking to his people that he's talking past them all the way to the Christ event exclusively, or sometimes even in a primary sense. When, when Jeremiah is preaching to the people as they are going out into captivity to Babylon, this is, to say that this is an earthquake is an understatement. They're gonna lose their language. They leave speaking Hebrew, they return speaking Aramaic. They leave with a temp, you know, from the temple system. They come back with the synagogue system. That's when that's developed. And um, they leave having their own country and culture. And then they live for 70 years with their culture and their religious faith being constantly tested and persecuted by the Babylonian Empire. So. God is going to speak to that situation to comfort his people. But within that situation, there is the seed of hope, like ultimate hope. The ultimate hope is not coming back after 70 years. The ultimate hope is that he's going to send his Messiah. And so it is really all about Jesus. But you could say the same thing about the prophecy at the, at the very beginning in Genesis when Adam and Eve sinned. And God pronounced his judgment upon Adam, Eve, the serpent, you remember? And then to Eve, he, he speaks to her situation. Your desire is going to be for your husband, but he will rule over you. Uh, you uh, your, you'll, your pain in childbirth will be greatly increased. He's speaking to that situation. But then in there, there's this seed of hope for the future, literally a seed, right? He says, but the off, your offspring will crush the the serpent's head, right? So there's an ultimate deliverance that's going to come through a, through a future Messiah. 
But God doesn't speak past people to just get to the Messiah. He speaks to their situation. And then within it, he says, your ultimate hope is not coming back in 70 years, guys. Your ultimate hope is that I'm going to send a Messiah. So did y'all hear what Stu said? Okay, so Stu's saying it's he his his concern that he's raising is that you could almost say that there was an original application and then after the fact these words get applied to Christ. And that is certainly the opinion of some scholars. That's why they don't believe that prophecy is real. And they say that all these applications of prophecy to Jesus are illegitimate. But if what you believe about prophecy is that it is a direct re revelation of God to his people, to their situation, but also in relationship to the Christ event, then you approach it differently out of the gate. Because what you're saying is it does have meaning to the like ad hoc to this situation in its original context, and it will also have an application to the Christ event. Right. Well, again, that's why I want you to write it down, your observation in its original context, because just like with the Micah reading, you can't say those stupid idiots, why didn't they get it? Because Micah starts out with a metaphor. What is the metaphor? Muster your troops. It's not a literal call for war. It's a it's a it's a sermon. It's a metaphor. If I get in the pulpit and say, Onward, Christian soldiers with the hymn. I don't mean for y'all to go out and go home to your arsenal and grab your weapons and let's march down Main Street in Lincoln. I'm using a metaphor, right? And so Micah uses this metaphor, muster your troops because we're under attack, but there's going to be a leader that comes from Bethlehem. And that leader does, in fact, come from Bethlehem. Uh but he's not going to be a military ruler. Now, he is going to invade. Again, look at Matthew's gospel and why he picks Micah. Jesus invades enemy territory in Matthew's account, and he in continually encounters resistance. It's resistance from the devil. So there's these exorcisms as he casts out unclean spirits. There's resistance from the Jewish leadership. There's resistance when his own disciples misunderstand him. He and, and as you go through the story arc in Matthew, he increasingly encounters resistance. Why does Matthew think it's an appropriate pull to go back to Micah, grab that verse and apply it to the to the uh, Christ event? Because it is like a uh, a, a, an invasion into enemy territory, metaphorically speaking, or not, we shouldn't say metaphorically, because if he's casting out demons, that's not a metaphor, but we should say spiritually speaking, it's an invasion, right? So it's a legitimate pull from the past, and it's a legitimate application, but he is making an interpretation from the Old Testament to understand what's going on in Jesus' life and ministry. And when we're not honest about that as Christians, or when we don't even know where these references come from, then we end up hearing not history, but holy history. It's in stained glass. It's not real. And what I love about the Gospels is that it's real history. We're watching what Jesus really said and did for your salvation and for mine. And we have this Gospel writer named Matthew who's giving us an understanding from the Old Testament scriptures to understand Jesus' actions. Does that make sense to everybody outside my own head? Or not really? Okay. Did I see another hand? It depends on... Who you ask? It's kind of like saying Christian scholars because you have believing scholars and then you have unbelieving scholars who just look at it like a bunch of ancient texts. 
Um, I'll give you one example. So like, let's say the servant songs out of Isaiah. Is everybody pretty familiar with the servant songs from Isaiah? So the 40s and 50s, those chapters. There are Jewish scholars that I've read, Rick, who would interpret the servant song as being about the people of Israel. About the Jewish people that they suffer. But that through their suffering, God is still continuing to reach out to humanity through his Jewish people. The argument from a believing scholar's standpoint, then, from the Christian side would be, well, that's fine. I mean, I, I don't I can see how you're trying to go about it, but I don't think all these verses can be applied to the Jewish people. For example, the Gentiles come streaming in to the kingdom of God through this suffering servant. And they, it's like a it's like a tsunami wave of Gentiles. It's not a few trickling here and there who convert to Judaism. It's like a wave of Gentiles come to God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, through this suffering servant, whoever this guy is. Well, if you look at Jesus and everything that's happened since, and the number of non-Jews who have, who have begun to call upon the name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through Jesus Christ, well, suddenly he fits the bill a lot better than, than applying those uh, suffering servant uh, passages to the Jewish people. Because the Gentiles have not come in to Judaism, but the Gentiles have come to call upon the name of, God, of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through the person and work of Jesus of Nazareth. So he fits the bill better. Does that make sense? And does that answer your question? Okay. Doris? Yeah, and and that's that's another great reason to do this kind of work because what you're uh, what you're appreciating there is when we say that the scriptures are inspired by the Holy Spirit, we mean that quite literally. That does not mean though that Matthew just sat down one day and started scribbling and all this stuff came out because that's called psychography. And I did my doctoral work on this kind of stuff. And that would mean that he's somehow a medium and he's just closing his eyes and writing. And we don't believe in voodoo, okay? We're Christians. So we mean that that the Holy Spirit inspired Matthew. And as Matthew went back and read the scriptures, looking back on the life of Jesus as his disciple, think about Matthew didn't write this while he's walking around with Jesus for three years. He wrote it after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, and after Jesus has ascended into heaven, after the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit fell on all the disciples. So Matthew, filled with the Holy Spirit because he was there on the day of Pentecost, looks back on everything that happened. I'm getting goosebumps just talking about it. He looks back on everything that he's just been through with Jesus, and he goes, and he starts reading back on the Old Testament scriptures, and he goes, oh, wait a minute. This all fits Jesus, and this is how it fits Jesus. And then he starts pulling it together so that you and I can look at it and go, oh, it does make sense, right? And that is amazing. Yeah. Well, you're, you're talking about history, too, and I like thinking about it, whether you're reading Jeremiah there or you're reading Exodus or whatever the example is that it's history in the way that it, how much it shows us about through these historical narratives, these historical accounts, these historical aspects of prophecy that tell us the character of God and God's continuing mm -hmm. character in the sense of judgment of sin, but also his mercy and his plan for salvation. And so you see these cycles of what will be ultimately fulfilled in Christ, but these cycles of God's sin, he can't stand in the place of sin, but he's going to show mercy and he's going to continue to redeem. So Jeremiah, they do get the punishment of sin. They're put into Babylon, but eventually he does restore them in that right. place. And that's a and that's a foreshadowing of what's ultimately going to happen in the Christ event. So, Stu, back to your uh, observation and, and question. Um, you know, Jesus is coming again, Stu. Uh, 
what in the world you and I want to do today in the meantime? You know what I mean? Like, because he could come back today, but he might not. And in the meantime, we got to be about the business of of God's kingdom. And we got to we got to be talking with each other and encouraging each other for how Christ comes to us even today uh, and forgives us of our sins. To to sit on a rooftop staring at the sky wouldn't wouldn't do, even though we know ultimately our salvation is coming. Um, we still got to live in this messed up world today, whether or not he comes today. You know what I mean? Like, and so the same is true if you look back in history. God is constantly saving his people and constantly punishing their sin because ultimately all this has to do with the coming of a Messiah. It is still all about Jesus. But in the meantime, they're being hauled off to Babylon in real time, and God speaks to them. And I think that that's, like you said, Dan, that speaks to the character of God. That's his grace and his love and his mercy, right? Because he's speaking to their situation in real time. Good observations, guys. Does it, yeah, Harlan? Uh, sure. Fire away. So that's a, that's one. Okay. So back to Rick's question about Jewish approaches to this, to the Old Testament versus Christian. This is a big one. Are you, are you referring to the, the virgin shall conceive? Okay. In Isaiah's context, if you go back and read it, it would be a little difficult to know that that has to do with the coming of the Messiah. Because in Isaiah's context, he's talking to a current king over the people, and he's saying that the people are going to be delivered from an enemy. And it's a real political enemy where this is preached against the backdrop of the Assyrian crisis. Okay, so this virgin that he's talking about is someone who in the next, I don't know, year or so is going to be known to this king in this royal court, and she's going to give birth. And before that kid becomes a toddler, um, they will already be delivered from the Assyrians. And they are. And like it, it happens. So this is one of those like y'all remember when I always like to go back to the example of Amos and he predicted an earthquake and two years later the earthquake happened. This is one of those when Isaiah said this about a virgin giving birth. There was somebody that they came to know in the royal court and before that kid that infant became a toddler they had already been delivered from Assyria and that prophecy telling the future being fulfilled within a short period of time validated everything else that Isaiah had said about how what you got to turn away from idols. You got to come back to your faith in, in God and only God alone. Uh, stop with this idol worship stuff. That's the meaning to the people at the time. It then gets later applied to the virgin birth. Because Mary. Uh, is is the virgin that gives birth to Jesus Christ. Now, the problem comes in here. The word that is used there is ha'alma. It can mean a virgin or it can be a, a, just a young maiden, like a young lady. In the context when Isaiah first said it, it meant a young girl. In the context of Jesus' life, it suddenly means not just a young girl, but a virgin, because the word can mean either one. So it's suddenly it's suddenly there's one aspect of that word that gets pushed forward because it happens to be what happened to Jesus and his mother Mary. Does that make sense? So in in Isaiah's day, we're talking about a young girl who's not a virgin because that's not where babies come from. And then by the time it gets to Jesus, so the nerdy the nerdy way to say this, guys, is that there's a semantic feel to words. OK, sorry, I try real hard not to be not to be eggheady in here, but a word has a semantic field. 
Okay, let me think of an example. Drive, the word drive has a semantic feel. You can drive a car, you can drive a team of horses, you can drive the ball, you can uh, drive down the football field, uh, drive someone nuts. you can drive someone nuts, or you can put the floppy disk in the drive. Are you all with me? There's a semantic field. The word can mean more than one thing depending on its context. Or a person has drive. Very good, Carol. Very good. So the word Ha'alma, the young virgin or young maiden, has a semantic field. In Isaiah's day, it meant a young woman who gave birth. And before that kid became a toddler, the people had already been delivered from Assyria, which validated Isaiah's prophecies about all the other stuff about leave your idols behind, turn back to God, repent. Everybody with me? And then by the time you get to Jesus, his disciples went back and said, you know, I think that verse applies here in a different way because Mary was legit a virgin and conceived by the Holy Spirit and then gave birth to Jesus. That verse needs to be understood in a different light when you look at what happened with, with Jesus' life. Is everybody with me? Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. So are we at a disadvantage because we don't know the original meaning of words? Like you were saying, you know, it really means this. Um, sometimes you can be at a disadvantage, but this is the disadvantage that I would say that y'all are in. Um, so my dad at one point in his life became an all over the road salesman when he left uh, teaching. And he was getting into sales and it was back in the day, you know, you remember they gave you a company car, you remember that? And he was just putting all these miles on it and he was shaking hands and doing deals. And so he'd be gone for nights out of the week. And my mom doesn't like to be alone. She got scared. So we bought this alarm system. We put it on the house and then she made me sit up with her at night, which I didn't mind because she put on all these reruns of old movies and old TV shows. And we'd eat deviled spam on Ritz crackers. Deviled spam and Vienna sausages. I think y'all call them Vienna sausages. Vienna sausages. Because we were poor. <laughs> and that's what we ate. And I liked it. Um, so we'd sit there and we'd eat. <laughs> this is just my life. We, we'd eat deviled spam on crackers. And we'd watch all these reruns. And we'd watch these reruns of these old shows. So. Some of y'all in here remember the show I Love Lucy. Everybody remember I Love Lucy? This is the disadvantage you're in in an English translation. It's like watching I Love Lucy reruns in black and white instead of a fully restored, full color 5K HD because they restored it and colorized it. Does that make sense? It's like watching a rerun in black and white instead of watching it on a modern TV fully restored and in high def. If you if you know the original languages, you can you can read it in high def. This is why there's a lot of people who say a lot of things about a seminary education for your pastors, but guys and gals, please don't ever let your seminaries um, shortchange the church by deciding one day that future pastors should not have to learn how to read Greek or have to learn how to read Hebrew. You should, you should require your pastors to learn Greek and Hebrew. And if any of you are wondering what's going on with Dan over here, it's not part of SMP, but it is part of an extension after he's done with his, with his program. And he and I have already agreed he's going into it because Dan is going to learn Greek and Hebrew. Okay. He, yeah, he wants to, by the way. Are you starting Greek this fall? Okay. So Dan is starting his Greek this fall. 
But yeah, so you're not at a disadvantage like you can't understand anything, but you you are at a disadvantage a little bit because it's like watching it in old reruns in black and white. It is. Because there's sometimes there's problems that come up in translation. And that's why I give it to you and why we do Bible study together as a congregation. I mean, we're doing this together. You know, I'm not throwing you to the wind and saying good luck. I mean, we, we're getting together and we're going over our homework together. But I do want you all to see that there is an original context to these things being uttered. And God did not talk past his people in order to talk about the Christ event. But instead, its ultimate fulfillment is in the Christ event. This is the same thing that gets said later in, in the epistles in the New Testament when it says these things were a shadow of what was to come in Christ. But those things were written down for our benefit upon whom the end of the ages has come. So ultimately, Stu, these things were written down for the benefit of those of us who are living in the last days before Christ's return. Yeah. So don't you think all of that then, I mean, with how you're describing this of the primacy of reading for the context of Jeremiah or whatever the example is, is to guard against the temptation for us to make it too much about us. That you're going to read primarily about what's the context of Jeremiah and the Babylonian exile. How is that then a shadow of Christ? How is it then through Christ also potentially looking to the last day? And then when you get to the point of the meaning for the church today, the meaning for society today, that that becomes only read through all those other lenses about what it means for me, rather than flipping it around and cherry pick a verse and try to figure out what that means about the end times. And when, when, when you read these prophecies in their original context, it stops you from cherry picking verses. It does. But it also, it, I want you to read it for this reason too, guys. You're not Jews, but you have been brought into the special chosen people of God through your Savior, who's a Jewish guy, named Jesus of Nazareth. And I want you to know these stories and these histories and these contexts because spiritually speaking, these are your ancestors, not by DNA, but you are children of Abraham. Spiritually, are you all with me? Th these aren't a foreign people anymore. These are your people because you've been brought in. And I want you to know these contexts because this is now your story because you have been brought in through faith in Christ. You, you, you have a people, and I hate to break it to you, but it's not, your people isn't primarily bratwurst and sauerkraut anymore. Yeah, okay. Those of us who are Vikings, um, you're, your, your people, you now belong to Abraham. And that's a real thing. Spiritually speaking, that's a real thing. And I want you to see these contexts where God spoke to his people and know that that's God speaking to, to your spiritual forebears. I don't want you reading it out of context like it's like we just popped up out of the ether. We were brought in to something that was already going on. While our ancestors were painting their faces blue in Europe and barking at the moon. Does that make sense? You're like, not my ancestors. Well, some of us can't be civilized like the Dutch. Some of us are Scottish barbarians. All right. I love y'all. Jesus loves y'all. I meant to get to uh, parables today. We'll just get to it next week. This was good discussion. Thank you very much.